As we prepare our hearts and minds for the message today, just a couple of things, just a reminder that you do have message notes in the service folder that you can follow along with and jot down some notes that will be helpful for you as we seek to apply God's word to our lives throughout the week as well. And also you'll note on the back of the pew in front of you that there is an area where there are connection cards that we would love for all of you, members and guests alike, to, to fill that out and drop that into the offering basket a little bit later as it, as it passes by. This is just our way of being able to stay connected with each other, know, learn about each other, pray for each other, and encourage each other throughout the week as well. So we'd ask that you would fill out those connection cards as well. So the section of God's Word that we're going to be looking at today as we dive into this letter from the Apostle John again, as we talk about what it means to love and what does love look like in our lives and what does the love of God look like in our lives. And today, as I mentioned before, we're talking about this idea of what goes into me will eventually come out of me, right? And so if I'm putting good stuff, if I'm putting God's love into my heart and mind, that's what's going to come out in my words and actions as well. And John really speaks of that very clearly in these words. So let's look at 1 John chapter 2. We're going to read verses 15 through 17. John writes, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you remind us that you are a God of love, that in fact you are love. That is your very essence. And today, as we seek to understand what love is and what love is, should look like in our lives, we ask that you open up our hearts and minds, that you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and minds, that we may understand and that we may be empowered and encouraged to apply these words to our lives each and every day. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. About five years ago, there was a study that was done that examined every song that made it into the top 40 from 1960 to 2010. And when they examined every single song that made it into the top 40 during that 50-year period, 67% of every song that made it in had to do with love and relationships. In fact, it's been estimated, and of course, I didn't take the time to research this fully, but it's been estimated that there are over 100 million songs that have been written about love. Seems to me that love is something that we have on our mind quite a bit, isn't it? It seems like it's something that we talk about, that we think about, that we like to sing about, and so on. And yet, love is a happy struggle. Wouldn't you agree? If you love someone, there are times where they're lovable and times where they're not so lovable, right? And if we're honest, the same can be said about ourselves too. Just ask my wife. She's not here to confirm, but I'm fairly certain she would, she would say, yep, there are times, as hard as it may believe, there are times where Chris is hard to love, right? Love is a happy struggle. And it's just so interesting that the most popular love song ever recorded by Whitney Houston, right, um, is I Will Always Love You, right? It's the most popular love song ever recorded. And do you realize it has to do with a breakup? Yeah, it does. And I think it's, it's interesting that this whole subject of love is something, yes, that we think about, we sing about, we write about, we, we talk about a lot. And yet sometimes if you were just to ask the average person what is love, they might have a very hard time defining it. So that's where we're going to start today. We're going to start defining what love is and then applying it into our lives as God 
defines what love truly is. And so where we're going to start is uh, we're going to simply ask the question, what is love? And according to dictionary.com, this is our first fill. And according to dictionary.com, love is an intense feeling. So for those of you who are married, right, just think back to your wedding day and the intense feeling that you had, guys, as you watched your bride walk down the aisle, right? It, is, it has been almost 25 years since I got to watch my wife, Jamie, walk down the aisle, and I remember it like this morning. It's an intense feeling, isn't it? Maybe also, for those of you who've been blessed with children, think about it. When moms, when you hold that little one in your arms for the first time, the intense feeling of love that you get, it's indescribable, right? And I think we would agree, love can definitely be an intense feeling. Love also is defined according to dictionary.com. This is the second one. Love also is a great interest. So in other words, I happen to really love the game of basketball. I know many of us also at this time of the year really love the game of baseball. Many of us love the game of football. I happen to really enjoy track and field too. So there's a lot of interests that we would say, yes, I love that too. That's another definition. Another one also is that love is a person that one loves. So uh, sometimes when we're greeting children as they're coming into school at Mount Lebanon, every once in a while we'll call them love, right? And my wife, I will call her the love of my life. I, I, when I'm texting her, I will also say, hey, how was your day, my love? You know, like we, we refer to people that way, the, the special people in our life. There's actually a student here at Mount Lebanon. Her name is my love, which I just think is so cool, right? It's just so cool. And so that's, it's true. We, we will call people our love as well. But when we compare that to how God defines love, there is a difference, isn't there? So, for example, if you look at the most popular verse in the scriptures, John 3, verse 16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So, when you look at that verse and you compare it to dictionary.com's definition, would you say that love is a feeling? Uh, not really, right? Is love a great interest? I suppose you could make a case for that, that God is extremely interested in you and me and in the world, right? And would you say that love is a person that someone loves? Uh, yeah, I suppose you could make a, a case for that too, right? But it's so much more, isn't it? It's so much more. Then when you compare that to yet another very famous set of verses in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and the Apostle Paul gives a beautiful definition. By the way, if you ever want to check and test yourself in how you are loving the people that God places into your path, just take the, the word love out of these, per, these verses and put your name in it. So, for example, Chris is patient. Chris is kind. Chris does not envy. You can very quickly realize, oh, okay, there are times I'm not so patient. There are times I'm not so kind and so on, right? But then when you throw Jesus' name in there, Jesus is patient, Jesus is kind, Jesus is not envy. Thank God for Jesus, right? He is our hero. He is our savior. He's the one who does this perfectly. Now, when you look at this, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now, if you look at that, would you say, is love a feeling according to these verses? No. Would you say that love is a great interest according to these verses? No. Would you say that love is someone that, that someone loves? N uh, again, not really. It's so much more. It's so much more. And so, here's our next fill-in then. How does God define love? According to God, love is a verb. It is what we do for someone else. 
So there have been times where uh, my wife and I, we, you know, we, we have had the pleasure of rearing four boys in our household, two of which are, you know, often grown and married now, and two that are still, so one in high school, one in middle school. And, and we have been challenged in our love for them, and they have been challenged in their love for us. Because again, love is a verb. It's an action. It's what we do for someone else. And quite frankly, there are some days as a dad where I am better at loving my children than others, right? Because even as a dad, I get selfish and I focus on me, right? But love at its very nature is what we do for someone else without looking for anything in return. And of course, the perfect example of that is Jesus and what he did for you and me through his death and resurrection. But love also not, is, is not just an action, it's also a direction. And what I mean by that, and this is our next fill-in, that according to God, love is given to me. So in other words, God directs his love to me through Jesus, right? And then shown through me to other people. I get to be, and you get to be, a conduit of God's love that the more that we understand what God has done for us through Jesus, the more that we appreciate the forgiveness the joy, the peace, the hope, and all of the blessings of that relationship with God by faith in Jesus, the more we let that soak in, the more it's shown to other people around us. Now, I want you to think about this uh, for a moment. I want to bring up this picture on the screen, and this picture is of Lake Geneva. I don't know if you've ever been there. My wife and I Uh, We celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary 10 years ago there at Lake Geneva, and we could not get over how clear the water is. And you compare the clarity of the water in Lake Geneva compared to some of the ponds that you drive by, you know, halfway through the summer when they have become completely stagnated and are full of algae and scum. You would never swim in one of those ponds. But Lake Geneva, sign me up. I'll swim in that water. What's the difference? Why is the water so clear in Lake Geneva? You want to know why? Because there are freshwater springs feeding the rivers that flow into Lake Geneva. There is an inlet of purity that leads to clarity in the water. Think about our lives. God's love, an inlet of purity in our lives that leads to a clarity of how we love other people. You see, love is not just given to us, it's also shown through us. And this is the reason why the Apostle John writes his letter. This is the reason why the Apostle John wants us to hear these words loud and clear because what goes into you will come out of you. And that's why he says here in verse 15, Do not love the world or anything in the world. Now, I'm just going to tell you that when when I read these verses just at face value, does it not seem like this verse contradicts John 3.16? Right? John 3.16, God so loved the world. 1 John 2.15, do not love the world. Doesn't make any sense, does it? What in the world, God, are you trying to tell me? We need to understand that there are three different uses for the word world in the scriptures. There is a use for the world that just refers to everything created. And I don't know about you, but we live in a beautiful world, don't we? Uh, Being out in Phoenix, Arizona for a number of years, there were a few things I appreciated about being out there, and there were a few things I didn't, right? So the heat, for one, during the middle of the summer, didn't really care for that too much. But you drive up into the rim area, which is at 7,000 feet above sea level, and it's like you're in northern Wisconsin. Just beautiful lakes, beautiful trees. The air is like 30 degrees cooler there than down in the Phoenix Valley. It's easy to love this created world. There's so much beauty in what God has made for us. Wouldn't you agree? But that's not what he's referring to here. Not only that, but in John 3, 16, obviously when it says God so loved the world that he gave, well, who's the world? It's all people, right? So there's the created, there's the people, but what John is referring to here in this verse is something different. He's talking about 
the evil of the world, the attractions of the world that may lead us astray away from God. That's what he's talking about here. That's the use of this. And what he wants us to realize, and this is our our next fill-in as we think about this, he wants us to test. God wants us to test. Just like we talked about last week, that there were a number of tests in our relationship with God, that this is another one. God wants me to test what I love and in what order I love it. So let's, let's just throw this out there. Do you love your family? Most days, right? Okay, most days. Most days we would agree we love our family. Do you love your friends? Yeah. Do you love your job? Again, most days, right? Do you love your pets if you have pets? Absolutely, right? Do you love your car or your home? Or I mean, we can just go on and on and on. There are a lot of things that God blesses us with that he wants us to love and to enjoy and to take care of, right? There are so many things that we are blessed with. But when they end up in the wrong order, that's when we have to be careful. And what's so interesting is that Augustine, um, a famous uh, philosopher and theologian, he wrote uh, the book City of God. And in it, and Timothy Keller, uh, a pastor um, who's now home with Jesus in heaven, if we can uh, show this picture on the screen here, um, this is a quote from Timothy Keller about Augustine's um, quote about disordered love. And it says this, this is a principle. Augustine, one of history's most influential theologians and philosophers, explored in detail. Augustine called it disordered love. He believed that our problem isn't necessarily that we love the wrong things, it's that we often love the right things in the wrong order. And so to put this in a very succinct way, let's bring up this next uh, fill-in. When a good thing becomes the main thing, So in other words, when my family becomes more important to me, or my friends' opinions become more important to me, or my job becomes more important to me than God, when a good thing becomes the main thing, then it becomes a bad thing. I want you to just think about this. This is extremely practical. So for example, let's say my wife is more important to me than God. So that means that I am putting her onto the pedestal of my life where only God should be, and I'm expecting her to do the things that only God can do. Is that fair to her? Not at all. Because, let's be honest, the difference between expectation and reality is the level of disappointment that we experience, right? The difference between expectation and reality is the level of disappointment that we will experience. There is no way that my wife can live up to what God can only do. And vice versa. If she puts me on that pedestal, or if I put my job on that pedestal, there will inevitably be a tremendous amount of disappointment. Right? When a good thing becomes the main thing, it becomes a bad thing. And so in order to really test what's going on, what am I loving? In what order am I loving? There are three questions that John wants us to ask as we consider this set of verses. And let's bring up the first question. What am I longing for? So what am I longing for? In verse 16, he says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh That's really what he says when he's talking about what am I longing for. He's referring to that phrase, the lust of the flesh. Let's be honest, the the sinful flesh is never satisfied. My sinful nature, no matter how much I fill up with the, the things of this world that I want, that my sinful nature may want, it will never leave me satisfied. And so what are some of those things that the sinful nature will run after? Well, the Apostle Paul wrote this very clearly in Galatians chapter 5. I'll bring these verses up on the screen. He says, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, 
fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this, the Apostle John, remember, he says, those who walk like this, in other words, walk in the darkness, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, at face value, you look at, like, so for example, sex. Sex is a wonderful, beautiful, great gift. It's a good thing, right? Within the confines of marriage. But it becomes a bad thing when it becomes the main thing, and we look for sex in other avenues other than in a marriage, right? That's the sexual immorality. That's what he's talking about. It feels great in the moment until afterward. Let's pick out a few others. Uh, Fits of rage. It feels good to get angry at someone who's made you angry, right? It feels good to just barrage them with hurtful words until afterward. And then you've got some damage to try to repair, if it's repairable, right? Let's uh, pick on drunkenness, shall we? So again, it feels good in the moment to be able to self-medicate and just get away from the you know, world's problems and our stress and anxiety or whatever it may be that we're dealing with. And we drink too much. It feels great in the moment until afterward, right? You see how Satan loves to put a twist on these things that, again, sex is great in marriage. Um, anger sometimes is justifiable, but not when we just barrage people with hurtful words and try to get back at them, right? Uh, Drunkenness is never good, but alcohol can be a good thing. But if we drink too much, then it's, see how these good things, Satan loves to put a twist. The good things become a bad thing when they become the main thing, right? So what am I longing for? Am I longing and lusting after things that are good that when they're disordered, become bad for me. We need to ask ourselves, how am I doing in this test? How am I doing in this test? Now, here's another question. The next question in this test that John gives us, what am I looking at? So in the verse, again, in verse 16, what does he say? He says, the lust of the eyes. What, what does he mean by that? Well, there are, there are things we look at, right? I mean, th- this is one I'm just going to tell you that I struggle with, okay? Because there are pretty things and pretty people everywhere, just online, on TV, in the movies, in the store, you name it. There are pretty things and pretty people everywhere. We can't stop ourselves from seeing them. What we can stop, however, is the second look, the lustful look, the lust of the eyes, the wanting something that does not rightfully belong to us. Well, let me ask you, how are you doing in this test? How are you doing with this question? Can do you see how God the Holy Spirit is convicting me? He's convicting me so that I run to Jesus. And by the way, speaking of Jesus, isn't this amazing that in Matthew chapter 4, uh, some of the temptations that Satan brought against Jesus, what, did, what does Satan do? He takes Jesus to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and all the treasures and pleasures of those kingdoms, and he says, all this I will give to you if you bow down to worship me. See, see how Satan promises you everything, but in the end delivers you nothing except for hell. Thank God for Jesus that he perfectly lived and perfectly loved, perfectly said no to temptation every single time for you and for me. Now, this brings us to the next question, question number three. What am I proud of? Okay, so in verse 16, what does he call it? He calls it the pride of life. Now, what does that mean? Well, what what am I proud of? What are the things that I look to as examples of, hey, look at me? That word for pride, by the way, and the pride of life refers to empty boasting. So in other words, things that really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. What what are some things that I look to for my satisfaction, that I look to for making life all about me? 
What am I proud of? Now, I'm just going to tell you, um, some of you, those of you, I think, who are, I don't know, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade in, in school here at Mount Lebanon, you've heard me tell this story, but I'm going to share it with all of you. You heard last week, if you were here at the installation, a couple of the pastors who were uh, blessing me and encouraging me with verses, you heard some of them reference my running back in the day. I was a good runner. I was a top runner in the nation in high school and college. I will give you that. But there were so many times, especially in my high school career, when I was being interviewed by newspapers, not once, not once did I give glory to God and praise him for the legs and lungs he gave me, not once. And here I am, 33 years later after some of those interviews, and I regret it to this day because I did not use that platform that God gave me for his glory. It was empty boasting, the pride of life about me. So friends, test yourselves. What am I proud of? Am I giving glory to God who rightfully deserves it because he's given you everything and made you all that you are as well? Now, why? Why does John want us to ask these questions? Why does John want us to give us this test? If we bring the next uh, uh, filling up on the screen, why does John want me to take this test? Here it is. He wants to poke a hole in my self-righteous pride. It's got to start there. It's got to start with getting rid of the pride of my life, of getting rid of my self-righteous pride. Because I don't know if you're anything like me, but when we look at what's going on in the world, and we look at what's going on politically, or we look what's going on with uh, what's happening in our nation or happening across the world. It's so easy to point the finger, blame at everyone else, isn't it? This world's problems are because of everyone else. And you know what John's doing here? He's like, uh-uh, look inward. Look at what's going on inside. He wants to poke a hole in our self-righteous pride. It has to start there. And then when we do, you know what that points us to, when we confess our sin and repent of our self-righteous pride, you know what that does? It empties us of ourselves so that we can then fill up with our Savior's love for us. Because again, remember, what's in you will come out of you no matter who's with you, right? And that's why when you look back at verse 15 again, just real quickly here, I, I want to um, share verse 15 again. This is just so interesting that it, the NIV translates it, if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. But in the original Greek, that word actually can be translated love from the Father. So, do you see the, the difference? That love from the Father, that love that we see in God so loving the world that he gave his one and only son, that Jesus came to this world to live perfectly in our place, that Jesus came to this world to die and pay the price for our forgiveness. For my disordered loves, for your disordered loves, Jesus paid the price for our forgiveness. Hear that loud and clear. You are forgiven. Why? Because of love from the Father, which then motivates us in our love for the Father and our love for others. And that's why this next fill-in is so important as we think about this too, of why does John want me to take this test? Everyone is looking for lasting love. Why do you think that 67% of all songs that made it into the top 40 have to do with love? Everyone is looking for lasting love. The only one who makes love last is Jesus. It's the only one. And the reason for that is what we see in verse 17, that the world and its desires pass away. So everything in this world, all that we set our hearts and minds on that are not of God, all that's going to pass away. It's only temporary. Only Jesus who kept the will of God, who lived the will of God perfectly in our place. A place. Only Jesus lasts forever. Only Jesus' love lasts forever. And so John's encouragement, John's encouragement is fill up with Jesus and his love for you. That's our final fill in here. 
what I fill up with overflows to others. Now, I want to demonstrate this for you. It's probably the first and only time I'll actually be in the pulpit here, but that's because this is a flat surface here. So I have a hard time pouring coffee into my mug in the morning. Um, For many of you, you know this already, but I have a retinal detach in my left eye, so I'm not real good at pouring things into things, so we'll see how I do. But So you'll see this right here, this picture represents God and his love. This glass represents me. This bowl that the glass is in represents everyone around me. Now watch what happens. As I fill up with the love of God and spend time in his word and spend time soaking up in prayer and encouragement from other people, notice what happens. I overflow in my love from the Father to loving other people around me. What I fill up with overflows to those around me. Do you see the value in regularly reading God's word? Do you see the value in regular prayer? Do you see the value in confessing our sins and repenting of our sins and running to Jesus? Do you see the value of then being in a Christian community like we are here, where we have people around us that we can express love and concern and pray with and encourage and support and so on through, throughout each week? Do you see the value of loving on your neighbors, those people who maybe don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, so that you too can overflow God's love to them, even in their unlovable moments? What I fill up with overflows to those around me. My friends, let's look for ways this week that we can fill up and overflow with God's radical love. You are loved. The cross and the empty grave proves it. And because you've been loved, love one another. Amen.